Good evening, and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Michael Grouske, and I am one of the AF Fellows this year. As the world's leading superpower, the U.S. is tied to practically every country and territory on Earth. Be it strategically, geopolitically, economically, or culturally, there is little that the U.S. can do that will not have significant effects across the globe. Joining us tonight is Mark Landler, a journalist from the New York Times who has covered American foreign policy since the inauguration of Barack Obama in 2008, first as a diplomatic correspondent and since 2011 as, White House, as a White House correspondent. Over the course of his career in journalism, he has been the newspaper's bureau chief in Hong Kong and Frankfurt, European economic correspondent and business correspondent in New York. Tonight he will discuss his new book, Alter Egos, Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, and the Twilight Struggle Over American Power, which explores the foreign policy legacies and relationship between Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, as well as a look forward with thoughts on what might change under a Trump presidency. Mr. Landler's Athenaeum talk is co-sponsored by CMC's Keck Center for International and Strategic Studies. As always, audio and visual recording is prohibited. Please join me in welcoming Mark Landler to the Athenaeum. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, and uh, thank you also to Minchin Pei for inviting me to speak. Um, Minchin has been a, a wise and thoughtful uh, source for me on China and, and Asian affairs for many years. Um, but our relationship has been purely over the phone. And uh, we hadn't met face to face until this afternoon. So it, it's terrific to finally meet you. Um, and it's great to be at Claremont McKenna. Um, as some of you know, uh, I have a colleague and a friend on the White House beat at the New York Times, uh, Michael Shear, who's a graduate of this school and who I think just spoke a couple of months ago at the AF. Um, so for those of you who listen to his speech, um, I apologize in advance for um, any redundancy. We actually do quite the same job, um, and I can explain a little bit about the structure of the New York Times. There's four of us who cover the White House, uh, and we tend to have uh, our own lanes of expertise. I focus on national security and foreign policy. Uh, Mike tends to focus a lot on immigration, gun violence, uh, and domestic policy. And then we have two other colleagues who do health care and, and other things. Um, but Mike and I have very much had the same experiences, and I think he's probably talked about some of them with you tonight. Um, uh, I wanted to. Um, also, thank you for including me in the tradition of the ATH. Um, this is uh, obviously a, a distinguished institution. The list of speakers was daunting when I looked it up. Um, and it's clearly an amazing perk for students um, who can virtually use this as their meal plan. Um, I mean, uh, if this had been open to me in college, uh, it would have beaten the, um, the Marriott Corporation that catered our food. Um, I'm not one of your big name speakers, um, but I hope that uh, I can give you a flavor over the next um, 30 minutes or so um, of how I see the foreign policy legacy of Barack Obama um, and his Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and what I expect um, from the next President of the United States, Donald Trump. Um, and let me just pause here to acknowledge one fact. I never expected to utter the words President Donald Trump. Um, when I was sitting in the newsroom of the New York Times on election night, um, I was as stunned as everybody else to see Donald Trump edge ahead of Hillary Clinton in Florida, and then North Carolina, Michigan, Wisconsin, and finally, incredibly, in Pennsylvania, where Clinton held her last rally with 25,000 people and Bruce Springsteen and John Bon Jovi uh, on the lawn in front of Independence Hall. Um, this was, by all accounts, one of the great political upsets in American history, uh, one that will be studied, debated, and dissected for years. And I can't honestly um, explain to you the mood in the newsroom of the Times that night. Um, we had been so certain of the different outcome that we had played it a, a front page with a banner headline that said, Madam President. Um, and we also had invited Facebook to record our newsroom live on election night so people could watch the New York Times 
go through the process of reacting to an election. And it was, it was almost like, um, you know, having live coverage of the Titanic, because halfway, <laughs> halfway through the evening, uh, reporters became ashen-faced when they realized that not only was that front page going to have to be ripped up, but the entire 12-page special section on the life of Hillary Clinton and the Clinton agenda was going to have to be uh, completely tossed out. Um, and, you know, candidly, we had done very little on Donald Trump. Um, we had covered his campaign, but we didn't have a 12-page section on the Donald Trump presidency. So at 9 o'clock on that Tuesday night, we sort of started from scratch and uh, put out a newspaper um, that tried to take account of this monumental earthquake in American political history. Um, it's obviously an election that's going to be debated on several levels. One is the nature of political polling. Um, which utterly failed to predict this outcome and, and, in fact, consistently predicted the opposite. I think one of the things that all of us at the Times were a bit chagrined about was our political barometer, which switched in the course of the evening from 85 percent Hillary victory to 95 percent Trump victory. Um, and then also just the nature of, of mainstream journalism, of how we covered the campaign itself. Did we fail to see the anxiety and anger among the, the white uh, working class, but not just working class, uh, some more educated folks who voted in larger than expected numbers for Donald Trump. Uh, and then, of course, there was the growth of uh, more fringe forms of media that played a big role in this election, uh, whether it be Breitbart News, which of course has close links to Donald Trump's camp, uh, or the whole industry of fake news, um, this conspiracy-minded stream of news that's now carried on Facebook and has become extremely popular and powerful with people. Um, I'm happy to discuss any and all of those issues during the Q&A. Um, what I'd like to do, uh, just in my prepared remarks, is talk about how I became interested in the subject of presidents and the uses of American power overseas and what my particular vantage point is for writing about it. Um, as a reporter for the New York Times in Washington, I had uh, the, the good fortune of covering uh, Hillary Clinton's first two years as Secretary of State and then Barack Obama's last six years as President. And, uh, and I'm one of the few people that I think was able to cover these two supremely compelling figures in these jobs back to back. Um, I traveled to 43 countries with Hillary Clinton. Um, I traveled to about a dozen countries with President Obama. Um, many of these trips were memorable. I I'll share just a couple with you to give you a flavor. And again, Mike may have done a bit of this a couple of months ago. I uh, was able to go with President Obama on a secret trip to Afghanistan, uh, by which I mean we were all brought into the White House a few days in advance and told about this trip and then told we could tell no one about it except maybe our immediate boss and our spouse. Um, and then when uh, the trip was time to leave, we, we drove to a, a very far distant corner of Andrews Air Force Base uh, at about midnight and we got on Air Force One which had all its lights turned off uh, and it took off in the middle of the night, landed in Afghanistan also in the middle of the night um, for security reasons, President Obama's entire visit to Afghanistan had to occur um, during nightfall. So we landed at around 11 o'clock in the evening, and then we flew from Bagram Air Base to Kabul in Black Hawk helicopters, again with all the lights turned off, the pilots wearing night vision goggles, um, flying through the uh, Hindu Kush, basically, and there was you know, a little bit of light in the sky from moonlight, so you could see outside these darkened windows, jagged peaks rising up around you, and it was one of those moments where I was really glad that, um, you know, marine helicopter pilots are so good at what they do. Um, then we land in Kabul. We have, um, the president has a midnight 1 a.m. meeting with the president of Afghanistan, Hami Karzai. He comes out, he holds a news conference. We fly back to Bagram Air Base, again under darkness. We arrive there, uh, but the schedule has slipped a little bit, a half an hour here, a half an hour there. And by the time we get back to Bagram, it's coming on about 4 o'clock in the morning, and President Obama still needs to give a nationally televised address, which he's going to do from a, a hangar at the airbase. 
um, and the uh, Secret Service come up to the reporters beforehand and they say, listen, um, it's going to be dawn in about 45 minutes and this plane has to take off before the sun comes up. So as soon as the president's done talking, you all need to run across the tarmac and get on Air Force One, and if you linger and wait, we will close the door and leave you behind. So as soon as the president was finished, we grabbed our laptops, ran across the terminal, uh, and across the tarmac, um, the engines were already screaming, and I, I don't know if you've ever gotten on a 747 with engines already on, it's pretty dramatic. And we climbed into the plane, they slammed the door shut, and we were taxiing within 20 seconds. So travel with the president is not always that exciting, um, but that's one of the memorable ones that I remember. Um, through the course of these years of covering Hillary and, and, and Obama, I became intrigued in the differences between how they viewed the uses of American power, um, where those differences came from, and how those differences flowed through the great war and peace debates of Obama's first term. And so I wrote a book about this. I mean, the title is Alter Egos, Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, and the Twilight Struggle Over American Power, um, which came out last April. Um, I would have sold a few more copies of this book had Hillary won two weeks ago, um, but you know those are the risks you take when you get into the book writing business. There are, however, a bunch of copies sitting outside, and um, I think the book still stands as a, as a useful record of President Obama's foreign policy legacy, and I think it helps frame the challenges and priorities uh, that President Trump will face after he takes the oath of office next January. Um, during this past year, I didn't cover the campaign, I continued to cover the White House, um, but I did follow uh, Hillary Clinton's foreign policy message very closely, and I also covered Donald Trump's message, uh, his foreign policy message. I covered his first foreign policy speech, which was um, at the Mayflower Hotel in Washington back in April. So I think I've developed a fairly good sense for where he is coming from on some of these issues. Um, I say fairly good because it's difficult to decipher and categorize all of Trump's pronouncements about America's role in the world. Um, as any of you who've watched TV over the last year know, Donald Trump has a way of being all over the map on issues, whether it's building a wall on the Mexican border, uh, whether it's scrapping Obamacare, whether it's waterboarding suspected terrorists, uh, and that's true too of his views on foreign policy. There is, however, a unifying principle to what Donald Trump believes, and it can be summed up in a simple phrase, not make America great again. Um, actually, the phrase is America first. I'll explain in a moment what, what that means and what I think it means in terms of his foreign policy, but I want, would like first to talk a little bit about Obama and Clinton, their relationship, which I think helps frame the mainstream debate over the role the United States should play in the world. And so let me start by making one thing clear. I don't view Clinton and Obama as being on opposite poles of the debate about foreign policy in the United States. They agree, I think, fundamentally on more than they disagree on. Both prefer diplomacy to brute force. Both reject the unilateralism of the George Bush years. Both are lawyers who want to preserve the rules-based order of the post-World War II period. But as that order has begun to fracture, and I think it really has in the past few years, Clinton and Obama have had very different instincts about how best to save and preserve it. Obama is fundamentally more suspicious about the wisdom of American intervention abroad and the wisdom of using military force. He also defines American interests more narrowly than virtually any of his post-World War II predecessors. George Bush once said that the American writ reaches into the darkest corners of the world. Barack Obama fundamentally doesn't believe that to be the case. Clinton, on the other hand, believes that the calculated use of military force is vital to defending national interests and that America can be a force for good in the world. She is, in the words of one of her aides, a textbook American exceptionalist. I think she would subscribe to George Bush's argument that the American writ does extend into the darkest corners of the world. 
I argue in my book that these worldviews are rooted in the respective childhoods of Obama and Clinton. Hillary Clinton was born in a rock-ribbed Republican suburb of Chicago in 1947, a time of boundless optimism about America's future and America's hegemony in the world. Her father was a Navy petty officer who instilled in her staunch anti-communist views. Barack Obama was born in Hawaii. Yes, despite what Trump claims, in Honolulu, Hawaii. And he grew up for a few years in his young childhood in Indonesia. His mother was an anthropologist who lived a somewhat rootless existence, shuttling back and forth between Honolulu and Jakarta for much of his childhood. I argue that this childhood gave Obama almost an expatriate's view, a third party view of the United States. The way I phrase it in the book is that I think Obama looks at America from the outside in, Hillary Clinton looks at America from the inside out. Obama saw firsthand the unsavory alliances that the US struck with companies and strongmen in places like Indonesia. And he developed a fundamentally jaundiced view of the role America plays, particularly in post-colonial countries. In his college years, I met the president of Occidental earlier. He spent his freshman and sophomore year at Occidental. Uh, he was friends there with a, a circle of Pakistani students. They talked a lot about this topic, America's role in the world. Uh, and, and he heard reinforced over and over again the theme of some of the compromises, moral compromises, the US has made overseas. During the 2008 primary, Obama famously attacked Hillary Clinton for voting in favor of the Iraq war. And I think that this is important on a couple of levels. One, it was devastating politically and helped contribute to her defeat in that primary. But second, it showed how for Obama, America's military misadventure in Iraq is his fundamental foreign policy turning point. Hillary Clinton, on the other hand, had watched her husband as president deal with several other conflicts before then. And I think this is a critical key to understanding the difference between the two of them. When Bill Clinton came into office in the 1990s, he had to deal with um, the Civil War in the Balkans. And his response to Bosnia and Kosovo was belated and tardy and often criticized, but ultimately it was successful. He was able to broker a peace through Richard Holbrook at Dayton that ended the Balkan Civil War. And what it did more importantly is it gave the Democratic Party an example of a successful military intervention. This was a party, remember, that had been really singed by the Vietnam War, the defeat in Vietnam, and all during the Carter, Jimmy Carter period had sort of resisted military intervention out of the fear of failure. Bill Clinton showed that you could do it successfully. But during that period of time, during the mid-1990s, Barack Obama was living and working in Chicago and Springfield, Illinois. He was a constitutional law professor at the University of Chicago. He was starting his career as a state assemblyman in Springfield. He was, his head was not in American foreign policy. And some people have argued to me, and I think convincingly, that the lessons of the Balkans were largely lost on Barack Obama. So when Barack Obama thinks about American intervention, he thinks principally about the Iraq war. Um, despite the big disagreement that Obama and Clinton had in 2008 over Iraq, uh, he of course decided to recruit her as Secretary of State. And both of them responded to this interesting personnel decision by pushing their differences underground. She became a loyal lieutenant in his cabinet. Um, he gave her more slack than he gave other members of his cabinet. But still, their divergent worldviews surfaced in internal debates on a number of issues. And that's what a lot of my book is about. Clinton advocated a bigger troop surge in Afghanistan than Obama wanted. She famously backed the generals and the Defense Department in asking for the full 35,000 troops. She wanted to leave more troops behind in Iraq than Obama did. This was to become an important issue because the hastiness of the American withdrawal from Iraq is cited by some critics as leaving a vacuum that the Islamic State swept in and filled. She led the charge to intervene in Libya, persuading Obama to authorize the NATO-led bombing raid there. 
She also pushed to supply lethal weapons to the rebels in Syria, something that Obama first opposed and rejected, but then later half-heartedly agreed to. So really, throughout the key debates of the first term, Hillary played the house hawk in Obama's cabinet. She did it discreetly, but she did it consistently. And in some debates she won, Libya, Afghanistan. Other debates she lost, Iraq, Syria. Um, but you know that was, I think, a very important relationship and in a way framed the way that the Obama administration dealt with questions of military force in the first term. If Donald Trump's foreign policy can be summarized with the phrase America first, Obama's foreign policy can be summarized with another phrase, and apologies for the profanity I'm about to use. That phrase is, don't do stupid shit. To understand where that line came from, let me tell you guys a little story in which I play a cameo role. In April 2014, I was traveling on a trip to Asia with President Obama. Along with a dozen other correspondents and photographers, I was sitting in the press compartment of Air Force One. We were flying from Seoul, South Korea to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. About an hour before we landed, the president suddenly appeared in our cabin. This never happens in the middle of a foreign trip. It hardly ever happens in general. Once in a while, President Obama would come back at the end of a trip to sort of go through what he thought the achievements of the trip had been. But for him to come in the middle was highly unusual. He wasn't smiling, which I didn't put too much stock in because he almost never smiles when he deals with reporters. He's not the warmest guy in the world uh, when it comes to people like me. Um, but he also appeared kind of annoyed. Uh, so I was starting to get a bad vibe. Um, I got more worried when he shook hands with my colleagues and when he arrived at me and I had my hand outstretched, he suddenly wheeled around, walked back to the front of the cabin and turned and faced all of us with his arms folded. Um, I couldn't tell whether he just didn't see me or whether he just didn't feel like shaking my hand, but it was clear to me that I was somehow getting a bit of a chill wind. Um, and I kind of thought I knew why. Um, I knew that the president's staff was angry at an article I'd written that had appeared in the paper that day about two major setbacks in his foreign policy. He had failed to get the Japanese to sign on to the Trans-Pacific Partnership the trade deal. And uh, in the Middle East, John Kerry's efforts to broker a peace deal between the Israelis and the Palestinians had fallen apart. Um, I think the president was unhappy with the way I put these two things together and drew some larger conclusions. Um, so I figured what I would do is just ask him a question right, out, right off the bat. So if he was mad at me, I could just get it over with. And I, I threw him a question about China. And sure enough, he batted it away and said, I'll get to that, but first I have some things I want to say. Um, at which point, the president proceeded to tell us that he thought our coverage of his foreign policy was shallow and unsubstantial. Um, he thought that we were substituting scorekeeping for serious analysis. Um, at that point, he looked over at his speechwriter, Ben Rhodes, who was standing behind us in the press cabin, and he said, Ben and I are talking about me giving a speech that will summarize my foreign policy, but I can sum it up in one sentence. Don't do stupid shit. America's biggest mistakes, he said, stem from overreach, not from inaction, from doing too much, not too little. He cited Vietnam and Iraq, and he noted pointedly that he hadn't gotten the United States into another war in the Middle East. He then went through a number of other things, and he talked about things he hoped to accomplish in his presidency, a nuclear deal with Iran, a climate change accord. Um, but by the time he finished his lecture, Air Force One had landed on the runway in Kuala Lumpur, and the president had to go up and put his jacket on and, and, and go down the red carpet. So he turned to us and he said, now what's my foreign policy philosophy? And we all said, don't do stupid shit, Mr. President, <laughs> feeling vaguely like you know naughty school children or something. And finally, he cracked a smile and turned on his heel and went back to his cabin. Um, that anecdote, by the way, is how I open alter egos, but there's many other anecdotes just like it, so please order the book or buy it outside. <laughs> it's only 16 bucks on Amazon, by the way. Um, the reason I recount that story is that 
don't do stupid shit actually went on to become the defining slogan of Obama's foreign policy. He repeated it several more times in conversations with columnists. His aides repeated it to reporters who had not been on Air Force One that day, and it quickly found its way into the bloodstream. It was always amended to don't do stupid stuff. Um, but as he prepares to leave office, it's more clear to me than ever that don't do stupid stuff pretty much does sum up Obama's legacy. Obama did do some bold and risky things in diplomacy. He negotiated a landmark nuclear deal with Iran. He authorized a diplomatic opening to Cuba after 53 years of estrangement. He led the talks that, that resulted in the Paris Climate Change Accord. But Obama's foreign policy is just as notable for what he didn't do. He did not intervene in the Syrian civil war. He did not precipitate or escalate a confrontation with Vladimir Putin over Ukraine or Syria. He tried with varying degrees of success to wind down the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. The question now is whether Donald Trump will continue in his cautious tradition or radically change course. Will he, in short, do stupid shit or not? The answer, I would argue, is not at all clear, and I don't think that'll surprise you. Um, if you go back to his first foreign policy speech in the spring, Trump said he wanted to discard generations of outmoded, discredited Cold War thinking. America's history of engagement in the world, he said, had left us saddled with allies who aren't paying their fair share for their own defense, trade deals that rip off American workers, and massive financial sinkholes in places like Iraq where we never really had a chance to turn things around. I think it's worth noting that there are echoes of Obama in what Donald Trump says. Obama, like Trump, came into office wanting to discard old ways of thinking about foreign policy. Obama, like Trump, distrusts the foreign policy establishment. Obama has said that they got us into one quagmire after another. Language is very close to what Donald Trump says. Obama, like Trump, thinks that some of our allies are free riders who rely on us to pay for their defense and give us nothing or little in return. But that's where the parallels end. Obama still believes that the United States needs to play a leadership role in the world, whether it's hammering out a nuclear deal with Iran or rallying China and India behind a global climate change accord. Trump does not evidently believe in those things. America first for him means precisely that that the United States should make every decision based on a ruthless calculation of its own interests. That means asking our allies in East Asia to pay more of the US cost for maintaining military deterrence in that region. At one point, Trump even suggested that the Japanese and the South Koreans should consider making their own nuclear weapons so they didn't have to rely on the American nuclear umbrella. It also means asking our NATO allies to ante up more for the cost of defending Europe. Never mind that the Obama administration has been trying to do that for years. And it raises fundamental questions about how committed the United States will be to NATO and its fundamental principle, which is the mutual defense of any member state that comes under attack. And among the most nervous places in the world right now have to be the Baltic republics, Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia, who I think have reason to worry that if Putin begins to push and destabilize them, that they can't count on NATO as reflexively as they could have, say, five years ago. It also means taking a zero-sum view of our relationship with adversaries like Russia and China. Trump has famously praised Vladimir Putin as a strong leader. He says he wants to reset relations with Russia, sort of ironic given that that's what Barack Obama came into office wanting to do. But no one is exactly sure how this will play out. It's plausible to foresee Russia consolidating its position in Syria and creating a new sphere of influence over the former Soviet states in Central and Eastern Europe. Finally, Trump's America First philosophy means shunning the role of global convener. This is something that Obama talked about a lot, and it was a role he really liked to play, that the US was really 
the country that could convene the world to tackle a tough problem, whether it was the Ebola virus in West Africa, whether it was climate change, whether it was nuclear proliferation. Obama really saw the U.S. as kind of setting the table for global solutions. Trump clearly has no plans to play that role. He, he says he'd rip up the Iran deal because it's a bad deal for America. He says he would pull out of the Paris Climate Change Accord, though I will note that last week he came to the New York Times and said in an interview he would keep an open mind about that. In sum, Trump has very little interest in an American-led liberal world order. If you were to frame this in geopolitical terms, his view of America is closer to sort of classic 19th century nationalism. In economic terms, it's closer to mercantilism. He's threatened, for example, to impose a 45% tariff on Chinese goods, an action that if he went through it, it would almost certainly set off a trade war with China. I wanted to mention a funny aside about the phrase Amer America first. Trump embraced this during his campaign as his foreign policy equivalent of make America great again. But he didn't actually come up with the line himself. It was suggested to him during an interview conducted by one of my colleagues at the New York Times, David Sanger. And Trump just liked the line. He clearly glommed onto it. So the next time you see Trump tweet about the failing New York Times, which he does about once a day, <laughs> remember that's where he's getting some of his inspiration. What Trump may not have realized when my colleague used the phrase America first is that the roots of this phrase date back to the isolationism of Charles Lindbergh in the years leading up to World War II. This is a really historically freighted phrase, and I think it actually takes an almost ahistorical sense to embrace it uh, and champion it, not realizing what it truly means. America first can really easily translate into America alone. Trump has said he has no time for the nation building that preoccupied George W. Bush in Iraq. He said repeatedly during the campaign that he actually opposed the Iraq war from the very start, although the public record on that clearly contradicts him. And contradictions flow throughout Donald Trump's foreign policy. He says he will avoid the next Iraq war, but he also says the United States should bomb the Islamic State back into the Stone Age. He says he won't repeat the mistakes of his predecessors, but he also said during one of the Republican debates that he would consider deploying 20,000 to 30,000 ground troops into Syria and Iraq since he had heard from a general that this was the best strategy to defeat ISIS. One thing is clear. Donald Trump really likes talking to generals. He's named one of them as his national security advisor, Lieutenant General Mike Flynn. He's about to name another as his defense secretary, General Jim Mattis. He's considering two others to be his secretary of state, General David Petraeus and General John Kelly. It's quite likely that the Trump administration will have the most military heavy cabinet of any in recent memory. Now this raises all kinds of questions about civilian military control, but I have to say I mentioned this to a very senior official in the Obama administration the other night, and he said, this isn't the worst thing in the world because generals tend to understand the risks and stakes of taking military action more than most people. And this gentleman pointed to the generals who served Obama. They opposed the military intervention in Libya. They favored staying out of Syria. They were in some ways uh, key advisors uh, in helping President Obama pursue the restrained foreign policy he's pursued. So just naming generals doesn't mean you're gonna end up with a warmongering administration. But it's also true that stacking his military, his national security bench with retired generals would deprive Obama of other perspectives, be it traditional diplomacy, economics, or development. And there's also a danger that generals tend to fight the last war. Lastly, Trump, with no foreign policy experience of his own, may find it difficult to resist the Council of Generals on every issue. And I found it very telling that after the meetings he's had with General Mattis, General Petraeus, 
General Kelly, he's tweeted each time, was so impressed by my meeting, was so impressed to meet the general. He hasn't done that with anybody else. None of the civilians that have come in to see him, whether it was Nikki Haley or Mitt Romney, he has not been this uh, sort of flattering in his assessment. So something about generals really resonates with Donald Trump. I have a personal theory, I haven't proved it out, that uh, one of the formative experiences in Donald Trump's life was going to military academy in high school. It made a big impact on him, and I think he views military um, commanders as authority figures. Um, I think it's foolish to predict any president's, any new president's foreign policy. Um, Obama came in promising to end the wars of George W. Bush and shut down the military prison at Guantanamo Bay. Gitmo is still open, as we know, and the U.S. still has troops in Iraq, Afghanistan, and three or four other countries. If anything, President Obama proved himself to be a far more expert and remorseless hunter of terrorists than anyone ever expected. He became an avid user of drones, an avid user of uh, the Navy SEALs, um, not just in the famous bin Laden raid, but in many other raids. So presidents have a way of surprising us. Um, they often find when they get into office, too, that they have far less freedom and room for maneuver than they thought they were going to have. And I think most important, presidents find that they need to take into account public opinion. If you look at President Obama's foreign policy, and if you talk to President Obama about his foreign policy, he will tell you that no matter how much he was criticized by the Washington establishment, the foreign policy elite, the columnists at major newspapers, he always felt he had his finger on the pulse of the American people. After more than a decade of war, Americans are weary of combat. They're tired of endless, expensive foreign entanglements. They'd rather focus on nation building at home than nation building overseas. Trump has a similar view, though his view is even starker than Obama's. He believes that Americans feel ripped off by the liberal world order, ripped off by free trade deals, betrayed by open borders, which bring an influx of, of immigrants, some of them dangerous. Um, he wants to pull up the welcome mat. He wants to treat international relations not as a collaborative exercise, not as a, a, a convening of countries the way Obama would, but as a business transaction where every single transaction has to work for the United States. I think one thing we all have to acknowledge about Donald Trump is that he read the frustrations and anxieties of Americans better than any of us thought he would, and well enough that he's riding it all the way to the White House. As he decides on America's role in the world, he will surely channel what he feels are the views of Americans, his voters, whether that means the end of the American-led liberal world order, I think is going to be the defining question of the Trump presidency. And with that, I thank you very much, and I'm very happy to take all of your questions. We now have time for questions and answers. If you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand, and Chloe or I will come. Hi. Thank you for thank you for speaking. Uh, earlier in your do, talk, do you mind telling me who you are, just so I know who I'm? Yeah, uh, just your I'm name. Alex Kenworthy. Great. Thanks. Uh, earlier in your talk, you were speaking about the confidence that uh, the New York Times and other mainstream media had in a Hillary Clinton presidency. Uh, given the Trump uh, victory, how is the New York Times reflecting on their election coverage and the future of uh, his administration? Um, I think uh, in two different ways. One has to do with our use of um, polling and, and predictive analysis. Um, and I think there's probably, a, a, I'm not privy to these conversations, but I think there's a great deal of discussion about the value of uh, percentage predictions on how an election is going to go. And I think all the pollers and pollsters, and not just ours, but Nate Silver and all, all the people that do political polling, um, are probably going to tear apart their models and figure out where they went wrong in missing the vote, particularly in these battleground states. I, I will say one thing, and I think this is important because it gets sort of lost in some of the, 
um, hand wringing after the election. We did cover um, Trump's campaign and the voters Trump was Trump was talking to very carefully. A lot of my colleagues went to they went to Kentucky, they went to West Virginia, they went to Wisconsin. We did long series on uh, the types of voters that were attracted to Donald Trump. Um, whether we did enough, maybe there was no way to do enough given how pivotal these voters proved to be. But I think it's also an unfair knock to say that we were ignoring these voters or were completely unaware of this anxiety in the electorate. Um, but look, this is a country now where the coasts are really radically div divorced from much of the interior of the country. And I think the danger when you work for a coastal institution, whether it's a think tank or a newspaper or a university, uh, is that you have to break out of that cocoon and you have to realize that the world you operate in has absolutely no relation to much of the country. And I think we all know that intellectually, but because we go home and talk to our neighbors on the weekend, um, you know, and I didn't see a Trump sign in my town. I actually didn't see that many Clinton signs in my town, which probably should have been a, a harbinger also. Um, but we just need to try harder to break out of that cocoon. And it's not the first time we've had this debate. I think in the 1980s with the Reagan revolution, uh, newspapers felt similarly flat-footed. I remember uh, in the 90s, uh, after Newt Gingrich, led the contract with America. We assigned a reporter to the conservative beat and were sort of roundly ridiculed for that, um, that we had to actually tell a reporter to go out and talk to conservatives. So I think periodically we have these moments where we have to do some soul searching and break out of the cocoon. It's particularly pronounced now. I mean, I think one of these, if you've all seen these maps, they're really quite amazing where, where they actually show the red part of the country and the blues and the blues are bracketing a vast sea of red. And so I just think that it, it just behooves us to constantly push harder to break out of that bubble, spend more time in these states and try to understand better these subterranean trends that are not obviously apparent, but sometimes bubble up the way they did in this case. Is it on? There we go. Thank you so much for your talk. My question is actually pretty simple. What headline do you think is both realistic and that you would like dread writing under President Trump for the next four years? Wow. Uh, I'm <laughs> predicting the future is dangerous. I mean, what headline? <laughs> um, look, I think some variation of a headline that says that Trump's first hundred days are uh, lively, chaotic, unpredictable, messy. I mean, I say that only because the first three weeks have been lively, chaotic, unpredictable, and messy, and I think that's the way Donald Trump's gonna govern. I think that's the way he ran his businesses, that's the way he's conducted his showbiz career. Um, he's not going to change now. Uh, he likes having people below him engage in kind of open rivalry, even open warfare. Uh, so I think some variation of a Chaotic White House is a headline we're likely to see. The headline I don't want to see is U.S. in sudden, very serious confrontation overseas. Because I think that of all the dangers of a Trump presidency, the geopolitical risk is the one that, that worries me the most, uh, partly because he's taking over at a pretty dangerous time. Um, I think that the uh, nuclear situation in North Korea has gotten significantly more serious in the last couple of years, um, and I think North Korea is a looming crisis. I think that he's going to have to do something to change our posture in Syria, but that's going to be very difficult. It's very difficult to do that without coming into conflict with either the Russians or the Iranians. Um, I think the Chinese are potentially a conflict point in the South China Sea, particularly if they decide that a Trump presidency gives them license to behave more aggressively. And each of these um, are, are very difficult issues to manage, even for a veteran national security team. Um, he's got some people that he's hired. I think Jim Mattis, for example, would be a very steady hand. He's been through all these things. I think he'd, be, he'd offer wise counsel. Um, I think some of the names that have been floating around for National Security Council give you a little more pause. They have less experience. They're more strongly ideological. And so that's the headline I don't want to write or see written. 
The chaotic Trump White House headline, I think, is likely. And you know that doesn't have to mean failure. Um, that's a way of governing. It's a very different style than Obama. That doesn't mean you don't achieve things. Sir. Uh, hi, thank you so much for hi. your talk. Hi. I'm Amia, and my question has to do with uh, US-Cuba relations. Um, and I was wondering how you see them progressing under the new administration. I know that Trump recently tweeted about if the deal wasn't renegotiated, it would be terminated. So just kind of wondering what your thoughts on that were. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, there are several different levels that the U.S.-Cuba relationship um, operates on. Um, some of them are very easy for the president to, to, to abrogate if he wants to. For example, the diplomatic relationship, um, he can end with a stroke of a pen. He has the authority to do that. Um, there are a whole maze of regulations that govern things like our commercial relationship, uh, direct flights to Havana, direct mail, uh, family visiting rights, um, remittance of funds. All of these regulations have been rewritten in the last year since President Obama opened relations. And that's a very complicated administrative and legal process. Undoing all those regulations will be just as complicated as rewriting them was in the first place. So even if Donald Trump were to declare tomorrow, I'm severing diplomatic ties, it would take him another year to undo all the work that President Obama has done. I think a lot of people who follow this issue closely have their doubts that he'll follow through on this for a couple of reasons. One is there are already significant American commercial interests in Cuba. Uh, the first regularly scheduled flight just flew there yesterday. Um, people are building hotels there. American cruise lines are docking in Havana. Um, and who knows whether the Trump Organization itself is interested in doing business in Cuba. We don't have any evidence, but they're in a lot of other countries. So it's not that easy, particularly for a businessman, to shut down a relationship uh, that's actually going to hurt people's commercial interests. Um, the other point I'd make about this is a political point. The Cuban-American exile community that was so hostile to opening to Cuba is still a force. Um, don't get me wrong. They are still a force in South Florida. But they are not the force they were even a decade ago. If you look at the composition of Florida um, ethnically, um, the Latino community is now much more Puerto Rican uh, than it is Cuban-American. And so you no longer need to mollify that group to win Florida. I mean, it was, it was true 25 years ago that you couldn't win Florida unless you basically went to the Cuban-American community and promised never to lift the trade embargo. I don't think that's true anymore. So for Obama, for Trump, for any other president dealing with Cuba, some of the political sensitivities simply aren't there anymore. So I guess my gut feeling on this is I'm not that pessimistic. I think Trump said that. He was probably pandering to some group or another. But actually seeing him go through with it when he realizes he's going to be hurting Royal Caribbean and JetBlue and all these other people, I just kind of have my doubts. Sir. Hi, I'm Ari. And you talked about Trump's confrontational style with dealing with China. How Possibly, do you think it is that he uh, that tensions in South China and East China seas would increase to the point of, say, brinkmanship? Well, um, my 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 worry about the South China Sea is that under the Obama administration and and Hillary Clinton was actually instrumental in this. The U.S. began paying close attention to this for the first time in a long time. Um, we, in a sense, inserted ourselves into that dispute. We never used that language, but we made it clear to the Chinese that we had an interest in seeing those disputes resolved peacefully uh, because we wanted freedom of navigation, freedom of commerce. Um, there had been a long period when we had our eye off the ball in the South China Sea, and the Chinese made a lot of advances during that period. My fear is that President Trump doesn't view the Asia pivot or Asia policy in general as the same priority that President Obama did. And so we may again take our eye off the ball. 
If we do that, the Chinese are going to really take advantage of that. I mean, and you can already see this happening. Um, the Philippines just elected a new president. He's, he's kind of a wild man. Um, but significantly, he went to Beijing and said that he sees the Philippines' future now more with the Chinese than with the United States. I think there's a lot of rhetoric there. I'm not sure I totally believe that that's where the Philippines' policy is going to go. But the fact of the matter is we're at a moment where the Chinese could really begin to make some inroads and I think persuade a few of these countries that their future does lie more with Beijing than with Washington. There's, an, there's an, a sort of an added issue uh, on this. Our Asia pivot was driven a lot by the Trans-Pacific Partnership, by this giant Asian trade deal. And that trade deal is now dead. Um, and it isn't just dead because of Donald Trump. Uh, Hillary Clinton came out against it during the Democratic primary. So support for that deal was fading in both the Democratic and the Republican Party. But I think it's fair to say that the final nail is now in that coffin. The reason this is a problem in Asia is a lot of Asian leaders took major political risks at home to sign that deal. The Japanese, the Vietnamese, the Malays. And to have the United States now just kind of walk away from it is a major setback. And it's a setback the Chinese are going to take advantage of. Because that deal, I think, was a way to bind Southeast Asia in particular, but all of East Asia to the United States. And I think lacking that deal is one more sign that the U.S. is not going to be as present in the region uh, as we were. And I think that that's, that's very problematic. And I think the Chinese who are were being aggressive even when we were there are now going to be even more aggressive. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, I appreciated your talk. I found it very stimulating. Uh, my name is Andrew Chachi, and I'm kind of, I know you're kind of a foreign policy guru, but I've been very interested in watching the recent election, kind of analyzing the sort of new, well, Trump, first of all, in my opinion, isn't really a Republican. I mean, single-payer health care, opposes free trade, like, you know, are you kidding me? But I mean, so I kind of want to know what, where you see the Republican Party going. I mean, Mitt Romney obviously would be reassuring to the Republican establishment, and what, what Speaker Ryan kind of, how he plays into that dynamic. So where do you see the Republican Party going with this new Trump? Is there going to be like a Trumpist wing along with the Tea Party, and like how are the evangelicals going to play, considering he kind of is lewd and outrageous? Um, but more importantly, the Republicans show that you can really win with just the white working vote. So how are the Democrats going to change and kind of remake the electoral map, because I mean, I I'm concerned as, as, as Democrat, well, where, where are we really, where are Democrats really going to appeal to nationally, and how are they going to kind of separate themselves and reestablish themselves, because they're not seeming to be able to connect to disenfranchised whites in the Rust Belt. Right. So where do you see kind of both parties going with this kind of monumental uh, shifting in the political landscape? Um, well, I'd offer a few thoughts, and you're right, I'm not like a political analyst. This on, on the same level as I can do on foreign policy, but, but a few thoughts. One is the Republican Party needs to decide whether they view Trump as a vehicle to get their own agenda through uh, and to what extent they may need to distance themselves from him if he ends up betraying them on core principles, which I think is quite likely, by the way. Um, if you look at some of the early signals he sent on the Affordable Care Plan, um, Act, uh, some of the signals he sent on um, immigration, uh, he's already shown that he's willing to depart from Republican orthodoxy. So I think that Paul Ryan is going to be one of the most fascinating people to watch in Washington because he has to walk this line. Um, so, now, in the last two days, a couple of these um, cabinet appointments look pretty good for the Republicans. Naming Tom Price as uh, the Health and Human Services Secretary, the Republicans have got to like that. This is a guy whose entire career is built around dismantling Obamacare. So if you're Paul Ryan, you're probably pretty excited about that. So, some of the things Trump Trump's want, wants to do will be welcomed by the Republicans. They'll be in lockstep on tax cuts. They'll probably be in lockstep on infrastructure spending. Ironic, of course, because they would have opposed Clinton's infrastructure package, even though it would have looked just like Trump's. Um, but I think it'll be this weird dance where they'll try to find ways to use him as a vehicle. And then on certain topics, they are going to diverge. Um, on the Democratic side, uh, I think your point is a valid one. Uh, the, how they appeal to white working class voters is a huge question. They 
obviously felt they could paper that over because their appeal to Latinos and other minorities was gonna be so massive that demographics would sort of carry them over the finish line, and that proved not to be the case. I think probably the most obvious answer to that is the progressive wing of the party is really going to be in the ascendancy. And while Elizabeth Warren herself may not run for president, someone who talks like Elizabeth Warren is probably going to be a leading candidate. And I think that all the Republican candidates are gonna embrace more the progressive themes that came out of the Bernie Sanders campaign and the Warren campaign. I mean, the thing that's interesting about Trump and Sanders, it's been said many times, is that a lot of their appeal was very similar. It was about the system ripping off the ordinary person. It was about the banks being rigged. It was about the fact that no one uh, from Goldman Sachs ever paid a high price for the financial crisis. I was reading an interview with Steve Bannon the other day, uh, the alt-right advisor to Donald Trump, and I swear if you didn't know it was Steve Bannon saying it, it could have been Bernie Sanders. It, he, the, the, the rhetoric was exactly the same. And so I think that the Democrats have people who can deliver that message, and those are the people that I think are gonna really be viewed as the leaders of the party going into the next election. Thank you for the talk, Mr. Landler. Sure. Uh, my name is Kevin. Um, recently, I've been reading headlines that said, like, um, there's cost the city of New York $1 million to protect Trump Tower. There have been very violent protests against uh, Donald Trump's presidency across the United States. This isn't something that's very common to the United States in regards to their president's elects. So I wonder, I wanted to ask you, how long do you think this attitude will last in the United States? And how Donald Trump can you diffuse this situation, at least in trying to appeal to all kinds of demographics in the United States? Well, I think the honest answer is that we're sort of in uncharted territory. So if I were to tell you it'll subside in a few weeks, I, I don't know. I think a lot depends on whether Donald Trump reaches out and tries to deliver a unifying message either between now and Inauguration Day or perhaps in, in his inaugural address. I, I mean, I think it's unfortunate that he hasn't done that so far, and in fact, quite the opposite. He's kind of stuck to the divisive rhetoric of the campaign in the tweets he's put out since his election. Um, and I think there will probably be some period of social ferment uh, for some time. I mean, I think it'll be fascinating, for example, to see how many people show up for his inauguration and how many women show up the next day for the Million Woman March. I'm guessing more people are gonna show up the next day than on the day of his inauguration. And I think that will in some ways symbolize um, some of the uh, strife that exists in this country. But to some extent, I mean to a great extent, it's up to him. Um, presidents do have an enormous power uh, uh, through the bully pulpit of, of unifying. And I think there's also a very deep-seated tradition of a peaceful transfer of power I mean, I think if you look at the rhetoric that Barack Obama's used in the days since the election toward Donald Trump, uh, I think if you look at the language that Hillary Clinton used in her concession speech, um, people are really trying very hard to make this peaceful uh, and to make America turn the page. Um, that said, when the president-elect tweets that he would have won the popular vote uh, if not for two and a half million voters who voted illegally, that's the kind of message that's gonna to continue to sow um, discord in society. And you know, I, I just would hope that over time, um, the better angels around him would sort of persuade him that it's not even in his own interest to continue this, that, that he needs to unify, he needs to get people past this. I mean, there is this issue of the recount, um, which is complicated. It's not a recount that the Clinton campaign is sponsoring, they are taking part in it, it's being pushed by Jill Stein and the Green Party. I think that process, unfortunately, is gonna take several weeks to unfold, and it's gonna be a persistent burr under the saddle. It's gonna irritate Trump. It's gonna remind people that he lost the popular vote. It's gonna prevent her supporters from kind of, you know, getting on with life. And so I do think we need to get through this period. Um, and, you know, I'm hopeful that in the end, you know, Americans do show a tremendous resilience and ability to 
you know, accept a constitutional transfer of power, but much will depend on Trump himself. Back. Hi, um, thank you so much for your talk. My name is Michael. Uh, so a big part of the Trump campaign was fake news. Uh, as, been, as has been released is that the fake news on Facebook has reached many more people than all of the major news outlets. Uh, furthermore, Stanford conducted a study that students don't really have the ability to differentiate between fake news and real news. Uh, as a reporter from the New York Times, do you have any idea what the New York Times is gonna do about that? If any news outlets will try to change the way in which they approach citizens? Just any ideas on that? It's, you know, I've thought about it a little bit. I haven't thought about it long enough to say that I really have a coherent thought. It's a very tricky question. Um, because you don't want, as a legitimate news organization, to change the way you do your work in response to this. In some ways, the best offense is simply to do what we do as aggressively and well as we can. I think, though, there is a significant question on the part of folks in Silicon Valley about how they're allowing their sites to be used as a vehicle for this. And I know that you know there's a lot of pressure on Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook to appoint an editor, to to you know vet things more carefully. Um, I I personally think that that's a reasonable thing to 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 expect. I mean, Facebook uh, and other sites don't allow hate speech, so I don't know why they should allow run-of-the-mill stuff that's just absolutely flatly wrong when it has a demonstrable negative effect. Um, but as for what we can do about it. Um, I think we just have to do our jobs more aggressively, more persistently, better than we've done them. I think what's been tough for newspapers in the wake of this election um, is, and I, I know this is true of some of my colleagues, is just a general feeling that um, what we did during the election didn't really seem to matter. I mean, we wrote hundreds of stories about Donald Trump. We wrote about his sexual misconduct, we wrote about his business ties. We wrote about his income taxes. We covered pretty much the waterfront of Donald Trump. And 62 million Americans did not care. Um, and you know, if you're in the news business where ultimately the reason you get into this line of work is to hope to make a difference, it's, it's a little bit depressing to feel that you didn't make a difference, that a lot of Americans simply either didn't see what you wrote or read it and didn't care. And that I don't have an easy answer for. Um, the one thing I'll say, the one bright spot amid the gloom is um, our digital subscribers have exploded since the election. We've apparently signed up new digital subscribers at 10 times our rate for this comparable period last year since the election. So Trump, you know, I think said something like he'd love to see us go out of business. In fact, business has kind of been booming thanks to Donald Trump. In the short run, I worry about the long run. Um, but you know, the, the fake news thing is, is, is really complicated. Um, it's very hard for me to see how you persuade people that are predisposed to believe this stuff not to continue to read it, and particularly when the vehicles to deliver it to them are as powerful as Facebook is. I just don't think there's an easy solution short of the social media companies themselves getting involved in the process. Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, my name is Malika. I wanted to ask sort of on a similar note about the role of social media and um, how do you think it's sort of shaped and altered American politics and also how do you incorporate it into your reporting? Well, I give you a very good recent example. Um, this is actually a debate that's literally going on as we speak at, at our paper and I think at a lot of other papers. How seriously should we take every one of Donald Trump's tweets? That's not a straightforward issue. He tweets five times a day. Um, some of them are outrageous, some are less outrageous, some are just him being angry, some are him be trying to be funny. Um, some of them raise constitutional issues. He suggested this morning that people who burn flags should lose their citizenship, which managed to violate two different constitutional stat statutes in one tweet. Um, and we're having a real debate because every one of these tweets distracts us from something really important about Donald Trump. And there's a school of thought that says that Donald Trump knows this, 
so that when he tweets about you know, uh, voter fraud, um, it's actually distracting us from writing about the fact that he has conflicts of interest in his business dealings all around the world. And that what we as journalists need to do is to keep our eye on the ball and keep focused on the really big questions around Donald Trump. But that's only one school of thought. Another school of thought, some of my colleagues say, no, he's the president-elect of the United States. If he's on social media sounding off on constitutional issues, every single one of those things should be covered as though he was giving a presidential news conference. So that's just an example as it applies to Donald Trump. Um, to come at it from the other side of the telescope, I think that the Trump administration, and frankly this isn't just true of the Trump administration, I think the Obama administration thought this too, has viewed social media as a way to reach people without the filter of the mainstream media. Um, you know, the White House started using Medium, they started tweeting, um, they started, they even used Instagram. They started doing a whole range of things that were designed to get their message out without having to go through the TV networks or newspapers. I think the Trump administration will intensify that trend. And I think the innovation here, if there is one, is the president himself is going to do it. And I saw Sean Hannity on Fox the other night saying, why does President Trump ever need to give a news conference? If he wants to reach the American people, he can just tweet. Now, to some extent, there's truth in that. Um, I think it would be terrible for the country if he just decided that social media was going to be the only way he communicated with people because he's basically unaccountable. Um, but I think it's transformed the way journalism operates, it's transformed the relationship that we have with the major institutions in Washington, um, and I think that uh, it's going to continue to be a major source of debate in newsrooms around the country as it is this week. Anyone else? Oh, there's one question there. Thank you so much for your speech. I really enjoyed it. Um, I wanted to go back to something that you mentioned when you said that the Obama foreign policy has been um, very much focused on not escalating, for example, um, the uh, conflict in Syria and our conflict with Russia. Now, in some ways, I would agree with that and I applaud it. At the same time, uh, academics are debating, you know, why is it that the U.S.-Russian relationship has declined so significantly, debating whether or not it's only in crisis or whether there's a new Cold War, as we talked about last night. So I'm hoping you, having studied his foreign policy, would give some insight into, even though he's been very successful in not escalating it, that the relationship has uh, degenerated to this point. Well, I'm going to offer a theory, and, and it some people will, would, will disagree with this. And, it's, and, and, and in this area, I am critical of President Obama. I think that President Obama made a decision in August of 2013 not to enforce his red line on Bashar Assad in Syria after the Assad regime used chemical weapons. He said, if you cross this red line, you will pay a price. There will be military consequences. Uh, and then he decided not to enforce that red line. He had a lot of reasons. Some of them were valid. Um, but I date Russia's aggression to that moment because I think that Vladimir Putin looked at Obama and thought, this is not a guy who's going to pull the trigger. And it will give me license to behave more aggressively and more provocatively. And I think if you look at the timeline, you can argue that Putin's adventurism in Ukraine and Crimea and then later in Syria all flowed out of that moment. So I'm not saying that's the only reason. Putin had all kinds of domestic political priorities. You know, uh, his nationalist stand is very popular domestically. To some extent, I think he was deflecting attention from economic problems. So there, there are other reasons. But I think in terms of just the interpersonal relationship between Putin and Obama, I think that the president of Russia judged that the president of the United States was not going to stand up to him. And when you hear Obama talk about Ukraine, um, 
he makes a very simple point. Um, he says, look, Ukraine matters much more to Russia than it does to us. So nothing I do is going to be enough to prevent the Russians from doing more. If I were to send troops to the border, he would send three times the number of troops. I think in international relations, they call it escalation dominance. So Obama's argument is, this is a no win. There's no way I win this confrontation. And I think he's right. I think that's a valid argument. But I also think that if Obama had followed through on his threat in 2013 on the Syrians, that President Putin would have thought twice about some of these actions to begin with. And I think that is a fair, I mean, that's one, I'm, I'm quite sympathetic to the restraint that President Obama has shown. I, I think that came through in what I said. But I do think that presidents have credibility and they have to be very careful to husband that credibility. And I think in this case, uh, he frittered away some of the credibility, and I think some of that is, is evident in the way Vladimir Putin has behaved. We'll have time for one more question. Um, thanks for a great talk. Uh, my question has to go, goes back to your uh, discussion on Asia pivot. The source, the source of the Asia's pivot for Obama was the rise of China, and they wanted uh, a reorientation in uh, Southeast Asia. And, and in fact, that's one of the reasons they also wanted to realign relationship with India. So um, in terms of the advice that Trump is going to get, uh, do you think that that same underlying reason about the rise of China, and if there are these realignments that you mentioned, uh, which take place, then the same source could again convince the military advisors and other advisors to again focus on uh, China. And anyway, Trump has been very anti-China. So do you th think that the advice and, and also the uh, strategic opinion that Trump will face would actually make him uh, go back to Asia pivot, a slightly different one, but focus on Asia? Um, I think that's a, a very good question. And I, and I think the answer is probably yes, um, in part because it's inevitable that he's going to pick people um, that will have a consensus view on, on this issue. Um, and this is a bipartisan issue. There's, there is no party divide on the rising role of China and what the United States needs to do to deal with it. So I think he will get that advice, whether he picks Mitt Romney as Secretary of State or David Petraeus as Secretary of State. Um, I think that the problem here is the following. Obama's pivot when you actually got past the rhetoric and looked at the reality, was really a giant trade deal, some military resources moved over there, and an enhanced and, and more visible diplomatic role. The trade deal is now gone. So I would argue the central pillar of the pivot is missing. Budget constraints are gonna prevent the US from really ever moving the military resources to the Pacific theater that they'd really like to move. And I'm not sure I see the Trump administration just inherently being interested in the kind of diplomatic outreach that Hillary Clinton did when she was Secretary of State. So while I don't doubt that they will recognize the importance of doing this, they're not gonna have the tools that the Obama administration had. And lastly, not only is the trade deal dead, but Donald Trump ran on a kind of a trade war platform. And so if he were to follow through, as I said, if he were to follow through on a 45% uh, tariff on Chinese goods, which I don't believe he will, but if he were to follow through on that, he would find himself in such a combative position vis-a-vis -vis China, it's very hard for me to figure out how he would even construct a pivot. It would, it would end up being a confrontation. So, I do think that he'll be told by a lot of people China's important. Um, he probably doesn't need anyone to tell him that. He knows that. Um, but what I find somewhat dispiriting about it is just that a lot of really good work has been lost, particularly in the death knell of the TPP, and that makes it much more difficult to see how you relaunch the pivot and make it truly credible. have for questions, please join me in thanking Mr. Landler. Thank you all.